Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome back. Today's Daf Hayemi is Misechas Nita Daf Chof Dalet. We begin on Chof Kimmel. On our base, four lines from the bottom, with a ton of Rabbanon. So as we've been learning for the past few days, an Isha gives birth to a live, healthy child, the Mazel Tov, would have to uh, observe days of Tumul, followed by Yemei Tahara, after which she'll bring a carbon. Of course, this was uh, adhered to in the time of Yes HaMikdash, the time of well, they observed Tum of Tahara. And it is conditional upon the uh, Vlad, the offspring, having potential for survival, for viability. So even if it's a miscarriage, but if it's uh, a properly formed and somewhat developed entity which would have potential if gone full term, would have potential to survive, to live. That Vlad has validity and renders her a Yuladis uh, with respect to observing the, uh, the count, the Meituma Emeitahara. But if the uh, offspring is defective to the extent that it had no viability, had no potential for life, you see it's, uh, it's so defective, it's so deformed, that um, it doesn't have viability, even if it would have gone full term. In that case, there's no Tumas later. Tonerabon, here comes another example of such. Hamapelas, so the Isha discharges a goof autumn, this uh, entity, this uh, body, which is autumn, which is it's, it's missing, it's, it's an incomplete body. Ain imoit meilid, there's no Tumas later, it doesn't count. How do we define this? Ve'ezehu, what is a guf atom? We have three opinions. Rabbi Aymer, if it's missing to the extent that if uh, it would have been a live person missing this much, he wouldn't survive. He would be considered a terefa. So likewise, this fetus presenting in a similar fashion does not have status. It's missing to the extent that if it would have been missing from a live person, the person wouldn't survive. So how much is that? What extent? Rabbi Zakai Oimer Adha Arkuva. We turn to the next topic. Rashi explains What makes him a trefa? He's missing from the bottom up, all the way up and including the knees. So uh, the absence of that part of the goof renders him so, you know, critically wounded, so missing, so incomplete, that he wouldn't survive. And Rashi adds the words, V'kasar treifa in Achaya. He's of the opinion that a treifa does not really have survival abilities. And therefore, in the case of the fetus, who presents likewise, it has no status. Rabbi Yana Eimer, you need more, more missing than that. Adla Nukava until the Nukava, the area where he sheds his way, so that 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 far up and including that that would render it uh, you know uh, would, would lose its, its status as a fetus Rashi adds because he's going with the opinion that a trefa merely a trefa a wound that considers him a trefa would not change the status in this case because a trefa can theoretically live Perhaps not very long, but it can live for a while. So it has status of a vlad, but if it's further up to the waste area, that's uh, that's an avela. Considered lifeless. Rabbi Yechon, Yeshua, even further up, it must be missing ad makim tabur until the place of his belly. But less than that. He would still have fetus status. What's the uh, subject of Machlekes here? What's the point of difference? Bein Rabbi Zakai, Rabbi Yamai, Ikibinah Trefachai. Oh, as we explain, big question back in Masechus Chulam. One with a critical injury, Trefa, whether it's a behemoth or a human, does he have survival abilities? That would be the point of Machlekes. 
Marasov atzreif achayu, Marasov atzreif ein achayu. First sheet which says that once he's classified as treifa, he loses status because treifa has no survival abilities. The second opinion disagrees, missing only that much, even though he's labeled a treifa, but treifa can live for a while, in which case he has, you know, status. Ben Rabbiani, Rabbi Yochanan, Ben What's the difference between the second and third opinions? Ika Benayu, the Rabbi Elazar. It's based on whether the adopter Belazar's point or not. Domer Belazar, Nital Yarich, V'chalal Shelo, Nevela. If an animal is missing so much, his thigh and the chalal area, meaning the socket of the thigh, is just now exposed, he's worse off than a trefa. It's not really a wound. He's missing his whole life force. He's on his verge of death. He's he's lacking. Vitality to the point that he's not going to avail. And Rashi adds that he's going to convey Tumas, so always dead. He looks alive, but he's really dead. So, according to Rabbi uh, Yanai, missing until the uh, Nekavim area, that's like the Yorech and the Chalal to such an extent, it's like a, a dead entity. Whereas uh, Rabbi Yechanan disagrees with that. The only way to discount this uh, fetus is if he's missing even further up until the uh, tiburi, the uh, stomach, the intestine area, which uh, renders him an eye entity. Amra Papa, Machalikas, this whole discussion, how much needs to be missing? Malamata Lamala, it's going bottom up. Whether it's the knees, further up, further up. Malamata Lamata. But if the missing part is starting from on top down, meaning it's missing part of the, the skull, I feel cold, do try if even he's missing. Just a part of the skull. Tahir. Because he can't survive like that. Ah, two more. There's charges, a fetus, whose skull is missing a part. Mother is tahir, has no status. Another halach from the same source. Ah, Pelas came in up. Kusa the diklav she releases this entity, which looks like a a stump of a palm tree. So it has these, uh, Rashi says it's um, uniform. But then, as it ride up to the top, you see like protrusions, like hands and feet. Totally wrong, wrong location, totally wrong place. It's like the branches off a palm tree. So, Kusa, the you know, branches are coming out of the palm tree. She's tired because it has no status. It's mine. Another example of a defective fetus. She's mapal, one whose face is partially sort of crushed and deformed. It's still called a vlad. It's not a vlad. You say it's, it's nothing. We had this price the other day. She releases this hand, a form of a hand. Chatucha, which has discernible fingers, or regal chatucha. So it's only part of an entity. Shall we assume the rest was inside? This is part of a full entity, and she's tamei leida. Imay tamei leida. We don't say shem muguf atem basa. Maybe it came from uh, an incomplete body. No, we say it was certainly a fully formed, uh, you know, a developing fetus with all its, you know, elements, and then it somehow got disintegrated. All, all that was left was the hand and the foot. The Misa now, according to you, Rish Lokish, even a deformed face renders him a non vlad Listen, so when the Brisa refers to a theoretical concern, we're not concerned that maybe it's coming from, it should have referred to this possibility as well. Listen, it should have said, you know what, this hand, this foot, activates two months later, as opposed to, we're not concerned that it, it came from a of autumn, a missing body, or you. Or another possibility, which would be a discounting factor, or if he's a deformed face, if in fact that would discount it. I'm not papa. I'm not puppy. So we don't have an answer to that, but a puppy actually had a different version of this discussion. The part of musmasen kliamli pliki. That's me. If the uh, face is deformed, partially deformed, all agree, it doesn't uh, cancel the validity of the vlad. She's tummy laid. Kipligi bepan of tuchis. Machlekes is when the, the face is totally deformed. There's no features at all. 
Actually, the, the names are meant to be switched around. Rabbi Yechon Amar, he says, if there are no discernible facial features, faces the window into the actual, you know, essence of the entity. If there's no face, there's no Tumas Leda. Because there's no Leda, there's no Vlad. Even in this case, Imutmi. Asks the Gemara, well now, if the tables have turned, why wouldn't Rabbi Rish Lagash now ask that same question that Rabbi Yechon asked him before? He should have turned it around and asked it to Rabbi Yechon. If Rabbi Yechon says, in this case, it has no validity. should ask him that price, which should have referred to a possible concern that maybe it's sourcing itself in a Vlad whose face is totally... Because Rabbi Yechon could have simply answered... It's redundant. The Bryce uh, referred to a non-entity, and this is just another uh, variety of a non-entity. You don't have to, you know, list them each one separately. Hi, Nug of Autumn, and of Tuchet. When the Bryce spoke about a missing body, this, uh, you know, distorted face is also another version of that, so it's not like it left it out. But B'nai Rabbi Chia continues to go the story of Rabbi Chia's sons. They had real estate. They had, you know, fields out there, and they went to check out their uh, fields. Nafuk, they went out to the village of the Kuryasa. And um, when they came back from their uh, inspection, Asul Kame, the Avoy, to the father of Chia, Amalam, he says, no. When you were out in the villages, did the local uh, villagers take advantage of you? Did they approach you with a halacha shayla? Such distinguished, you know, guests, did they, Amalam, kluma, bomas liyadchem? Did you encounter any stories, any uh, halacha shaylas? Amalam, they said, actually, we had this woman who was mapil panam tuchais, this type of case with a distorted face. But the was presented to us. Viti meinua, what did we do? We made her tummy. We considered it a vlad. Amalahem, Shabchia says to them, go back and correct it. Reverse your ruling, it's incorrect. It has no status, no face, no vlad. Zubitar, umashitimesim, go bimitar, reverse your psak of tumma. Maida tchayu. Where are you coming from? Maida tchayu. L'chumr, you figured, okay, we'll be strict. Well, actually, Tumas Leda has two elements. It begins with a Tum account, but followed by Yimei Tahara. So, in a sense, you're being Machmer, but you're also being Mekel. Because during the Yimei Tahara, any blood she sees is tar. So it's not just a Chumrah, it's resulting in a leniency as well, if you give it status, when you shouldn't have. It generates a kula as well. You're giving a yimei toyar, which you shouldn't have. Itma. Okay, here comes an interesting discussion on Pelas Bria. The woman discharges this uh, entity. She has two backs, uh, two spines. Okay, so it has these uh, Siamese backs with spines. Does this have any uh, chance of survival? Big machlag is between Rav, who says no way, and Shmuel says yes. Amar Rav, Bisha ain't a Vlad. If it happened by a woman, there's no Vlad uh, status, there's no Tomas Leda, but Mehema Osbachila. Even if you discover this uh, double backed uh, animal inside an animal that you slaughter, which typically would be reason to be Matar, the uh, Ben Pekua, right? That's discovered in the animal, in his case, it's a uh, Non viable entity it doesn't have status of a behem, of a living of a behem, but it's not, uh, it's like a novella, it's like a dead piece of. Ushmul Omar, he says, no, Beisho Vlad, Behem Mutabachilo, discovered uh, inside a behem, you can eat it. It's covered by the mother Shkita and by Isha, who miscarries this type of entity. It has status and she has two months later. And Foshan points out, even Shmuel would agree if this uh, double backed animal is already born, of course it's Asr. That is what's called shesua, discussed in the Chumash Devarim, a type of animal which is non-kosher. But he was speaking that within the mother, we're not trying to you know, evaluate it on its own, define it on its own, as its own entity, its own species. It's inside another animal which had been shechted. So whatever's in an animal is mutter. And this is like any other animal, which is mutter through the mother shechid. That's Shmuel's opinion. Michael Mephlaki. Okay, what's the background of this machlekes? Answers the Gemara by the Rav Chanan Bar Abba. The Rav Chanan Bar Abba. We take a close look at that pasuk and dvarim 
Perak Yudalad Pasuk Sai, which has a, a listing of uh, non kosher animals. Amongst them, we have a unique name of an animal, unmentioned in Vayikra. So, this animal is unique to Devarim, Hashisua, which is a Bria, a type of animal, Shiyeshla, described exactly as such. Shnei Gabin, Shnei Shadrois. The Torah forbids its consumption. In what fashion? For this we have a machlekes Rav Mishmo. Rav Amar Bria Ba'al Malasa. Rav says there's no such existence, there's no such species of a Shesua. You'll never find them running around. Unless you discover it inside a cow, inside a goat. So it's like sort of a disfigured goat or disfigured cow. Otherwise you'll never find it. So when the Torah forbids it, it specifically, even though it was discovered inside another kosher animal, ki agur rachman lomeshu, and Hashem taught Moshe that it's forbidden. Be mei ima agur. It was referring to an animal discovered within a mother animal. It has no viability. It's like an avail. It's us. Ushmo lo mabriya ba'al meisa. Ushmo disagrees. It can happen that you'll have one of these things running around. Ki agur rachman lomeshu ba'al magmer. And the Torah says, don't eat it. It means you know uh, a regular shesur should not be eaten. But if it's within the mother animal, it becomes, you know, it's part of the mother entity. And since, according to Shmuel, it has viability, it's like any other animal, and uh, we don't have to identify it by name, by its own class, it's uh, secondary, it's, it's, it's bottle, it's tuffle, to the mother animal, Shari, it's mutatit. Eisvei Rav Shimi Barchil Rav. Rav Shimi Barchil was actually Rav's grandson. So he went over to the Zaid, he says, have a kasha. Raisa says, Rabbi Chanin ben Tignas Oimer, kol sheyesh loi, shnei gavin, ushnei shedroiz, posel avoid. So we have a, a bachar. Uh, sorry, we have a, a yeah, bachar animal, which has kadusha, unless it's a, you know, baal mum, it's a blemished animal, and yet you can't bring it as a karm. An example of such is the double-backed animal. Pasal you can't bring it as a cover. Alba the Now the fact that the Mishnah refers to it as a, you know, Bukhar Balmum, disqualifying it from Hakrava indicates that otherwise he's good to go. He's kosher, right? He's a surviving entity. He's not an Avela. In contrast to what we're saying till now, that... Uh, this thing doesn't really have kashra status. According to Rab, even inside the mother animal, according to Shmuel, certainly once it's born. Armalais, he says to his grandson, with adoration, Shimi at, oh, you're, you're my grandson, Shimi. Right on. You're always on target. But let me explain it to you. Let me answer your question. So first he validated his question, and then he answered him. He says, look, the Brisa that you quoted, the uh, blemish that you're describing there is not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual double back, actual Siamese spines. And that's talking about sort of a bent back, like a hunchback animal, which looks like two parts put together. That's a different story. That's, that's okay. That can survive and live for uh, hundred and months. Mesve, now comes another kash. Yesh bu boren, shein asurin. bu boren, Unborn, you know, animals, which, if uh, you know, discovered inside the mother animal, are of course permissible, even if they're not fully full termed, right? Because anything in the mother, but behem, anything in the behem is mutter. But once it's born, if it's not viable, if it's born too premature, shein asur, be asur, because they can't survive like an avela. Ben abola daka. So by Vehima uh, Daka, which is, you know, the lighter type of, uh, like a goat, like a sheep, where full term there is five months, if this one was born after four, too early, premature, he's not going to survive. Ben Shmona Lagasa, by a heavy animal, like a cow, it's a, it's a nine-month uh, gestation period, so if it's born in eight months, too short, too early, premature. And certainly, younger than that, Himena Lamata, of course, is us. The Brisa continues. But this is an exception. And in a minute, we'll just try to figure out what the Brisa had in mind. Yotz, as opposed to Mishi Eshle Shnei Gabin, Shnei as opposed to the double-backed animal. 
who has a different story. In what way? What does that mean? My Yatza. What does it mean? He has his own story. Love. Yatza Mechlal Bar. Apparently, the rice is contrasting the uh, Shesua, right, the double-backed animal, to the other uh, unborn animals inside their mothers. That, in contrast to those young, premature, unborn animals which are mutter, because it's still in the mother, they're included sort of in the mother's package, as long as they're not born. Once they're born, of course, like we said, it's asr, but inside the mother, the mutter, as opposed to the double-backed entity, even if you discovered inside the mother animal, it's asr. And this seems to be siding with Rav's opinion. It's like an avela. has no chance of survival. Even inside the mother, he can't eat. So as the more hold it, Rav Metaret Rav and Shmuel have different ways of learning the price. Rav Metaret Tamei. Rav will now explain this price according to his opinion. And the Mepharshim point out that really there's some, somewhat of a difficulty, even according to Rav. It's certainly a kasha on Shmuel. Because here in the Bryce it says that the, you know this double-backed entity will be usher even inside the mother. But it's also somewhat difficult, according to Rav as well, because it, it implies, it sounds from the Bryce that like, this double-backed entity would be okay even after birth, which according to Rav, even according to Rav is usher. So each uh, Amira will now have to sort of tweak the Bryce based on his position. Rav metarets al Rav will explain the Bryce alongside his opinion as follows. But the Brysa, in referring to the double-backed creature, is actually forbidding it while inside the mother. And we're speaking strictly inside. Rav Mutaros Tamei. Ben Arba Ladaka, Ben Shmoina Lagasa. We have these, you know, premature fetuses. A four-month Daka, eight-month Gasa. Heimer Almata Aser. Certainly if it's younger than that, it will be Aser. Bame Devar Mamurim. What are we talking about? Once it's born, but it's still unborn, it's okay, because it's still considered part of the mother's entity. But that's limited to these. But a double-backed entity, Yatsa, as opposed to Mishishle, Shnei Gabin, Shnei Shadrois. In that case, even while inside, it's Aser. It's a non-viable entity, it's an Avela. Da'afilu b'me'imu nami Aser. And that's the Ishesua which is considered a non-kosher entity. It says Rav's approach. We turn to him. Shmuel Metaros Tamei. Shmuel will interpret the price according to his view. Ben Arbo Ludak Ben Shmuel Lugasa The premature animals. Heimen Ulamata Osur It's even less developed than that. Certainly it's Osur. Bame Devar Mamur When do we say that these things are Osur? And according to him, we're talking when it's already born. So these young, premature entities are also because they're not viable. When do we say so? It's born prematurely. But if it's a full term fetus, full five months by the daka, full nine months by motor, of course you can eat it. Even in its unborn state. As opposed to the double-backed animal, that has an additional layer of Israel. Even if it's a full-term fetus, so if it's born, it's Asr, because then you have to sort of evaluate it on its own, by its own merits. And as we said before, it's considered a non-kosher entity. That's a shesua. But if it's still within the mother, you can deem it as part of the mother's entity. Me'imoyitshar. Okay, so Rav and Shmuel have different uh, ways to understand the brisa. Brisa forbids the double-backed animal, according to Rav. Even within the mother, according to Shmuel, only once born, but within the mother, it's sort of packaged within the mother's entity and its mother. Okay, so we had a discussion about this animal with the Shnei Gaben, Shnei Shadrois. It pertained to whether the mother, a human mother, would be 
liable to the whole system, the whole count of two months later. Rav says no, Shmuel says yes. Rav says it has no viability, Shmuel says it does. And in a similar fashion, we discussed the kashras, if it, were, if it were an animal born in this fashion. All agree, once it's born, it will be Asr. But still within the mother's entity, Shmuel says, well, according to Taisvis, it has viability, and although once born it's Asr, because it's called the Yashasur, but while still within the mother, it's sort of embedded within the mother's entity, and it's Mutter, and Rav disagrees. It's uh, such a non-viable entity. It's like an avail, even when it's an when it's still in its unborn state. Tony Tanak made the Rav. There was a Chacham that presented a Brisa to Rav. That uh, presented a Brisa to Rav. Hamapelas Brias Guf Sheinei Chatuch. So we have this stump. So a woman miscarried this entity which doesn't have much formation. It's like a block of wood. Or it's a head, or face which has no, just a round ball. Does that trigger the whole two months later system? Tamad Leimar? No. It has no viability. It can't survive. So we speak about a woman giving birth who begins the, uh, to the, you know, the account of Yemei Tuma. The Pasuk refers to uh, the bris mila. There's a link between the two. Only a, a child who has that potential has the ability to survive and to have a bris. He qualifies. For two months later, Misha Roy the bris the Shmoina, right? He's right to make a bris at eight days. Yotz Roy as opposed to these phenomena we just discussed, which have no viability. Sheinon ruin the bris Shmoina. It's not uh, not Roy for a bris on the eighth day. And there was no two months later. Amar Lei Rav Rav added to added to him. He says, look, Sayin Bahachi. He should uh, conclude the bris uh, with another example of a non-viable entity. That's the double back to. Uh, Entity we spoke about before, Vachain, I like what, but Vishyesh Lesh Negav, Vishyesh Adroy, it's a double backed entity. It's not right to live it's not right to survive. Therefore, there's not too much light. Okay, now comes Halacha Lamaisa, Rabbi Yermi Bar Abba, Savar, he figured, we'll go with Shmuel's opinion, and we'll apply too much later. By Nisha, who gave birth to this type of armor lace, Rav Huna tells him, my daitach, what are you basing it on? The Chumra, because you're going to be strict. Well, actually, as we discussed before, the uh, Tumas Leid, there's a double edge, it's like a double system. It has a, a Chumrah, but it leads into a Kula. The Chumrah, Chumrah, the Asa, the Kula, the Kayhavis law. You're giving her Dmei Toyar, Days of Tahara, which wouldn't be justified if it's not a Evlam. And therefore, he says, Avod Mio, Kabeza, the Rav. You know what? Uh, go, go the short way, go with Rav. The Kaimul and Hokas Kavase Karabi Surah, because we have this tradition that we go with Rav in matters of Isra Vahatar, whether it generates a Khumra or a Kula, be on the safe side. Bain the Kula, Bain the Khumra. Amar Rav. Now comes an interesting uh, point. We discussed the, uh, the uh, premature births of these animals, right? The uh, four month uh, Daka, which is a month short, or the eight month Gasa, which is a, a month short. Now we know that by a, 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 a human, by Isha, at uh, least in the time of Chazal, the only uh, child that can survive viability was related to either a full term baby, a nine month, uh, nine term baby, or seven month. So it was either born in the seventh or the ninth. An eight month, eight month baby couldn't survive. So, what about in a similar fashion by an animal? We have this behemoth gas. Ideally, it should be a nine month gestation period. What if it's a seven month stretch? So the Rice spoke about eight being non-viable. What about number seven? Which is ironic because it's shorter, but perhaps just like by human, it's seven or nine. What about by the Behemoth Gasa? Amor Rabbi, Amor Hari Amor, we know for a fact. Eishe Yeledes Letisha, Yeledes Leshiva. A woman can give birth to a healthy child either at nine or at seven. Behemoth Gasa Yeledes Letisha, by Behemoth Gasa as well. A full term is nine. I have a question. Does seven month work as well? Yeledes Leshiva, can it work at 7 or not? Let's bring it right from that price. A 4 month Daka, an 8 month Gasa doesn't work. And certainly younger than that. Hey man, Olamata is also. My Lava Gasa. Let's assume it's referring to the uh, Gasa as well. So 8 month doesn't work, and certainly less, only 7. Loy, Adaka, no, maybe it's only going on the Daka, whose full term is 5. 
But if it's four or less, it doesn't work. It's too short. But maybe, you know, if you just trim off uh, from the nine, the starting point is nine. So, yeah, eight doesn't work. But maybe seven does. Maybe that's sufficient for uh, its development. Hi, my. says the Gemara, hold it. You can't say that. Yamas Vashlema Gasso. If, when the Bryce spoke about premature not working by the uh, Gasa as well, so I understand why the Bryce had to point it out. Could you think maybe, you know, it's long enough? You don't need that much. Seven could work too. It's strict. There's reason to talk about it. I mean, there's room to think. Perhaps the animal has a parallel system to the Isha. Just like when the Isha works with seven. That prompted the, uh, the Bryce to point out, no. Behemoth is different. Seven doesn't work. Just like eight. Eli Amras Adaka Itma, but if the Bryce is speaking about the Daka only, that just as four doesn't work, certainly three. Pshita, obviously, how could it? It's barely three months old. Pshita, Bastlosa, Yarchim, Kachai, how could you have a three month viable offspring? So, as it were, no. Maybe it's just about deducting two. Whatever the uh, sum total is, if it's uh, nine, go down to seven, it's okay. If the starting point is five, so three is also fine. It's not a matter of months, it's a matter of you know, proportions. Istrich. The Brysa did, did have to point out that a three-month gedaka doesn't work. You would think, maybe it does, because it's barely two months off the uh, sum total. So, like that, I mean, there's room to think. Whenever you deduct, you know, two months of the total, it works. By the Isha, go down to seven. By the uh, Behemagasa, likewise. And by the, uh, the Daka, three maybe works. Right? Kamash Malon. Therefore, the Bryce had to tell you, that by the dock it's different because the starting point is so it's so short it's only five months so four doesn't work it's certainly three but maybe by the gasa since the starting point is a much greater number nine so maybe seven works just like by the isha so we haven't really resolved this uh, question it comes a new scenario omar vida mashmoha pelas muslilis isha miscarries something which appears like a demon so it has a human-like uh, look but with wings very unique phenomenon that qualifies as a Vlad for two months later. Vlad is considered a Vlad, but he has the add on feature of wings. Tanami, <laughs> we find the same in the Bryce, somewhere behind Mas, it was actually a story. It's not just theoretics, it was a story in a place called Bessimaini. Ba'achashi pilled Muslims, a woman had this phenomenon. Uba Mas, and Chamus presented the Chacham, Amr, they said, Yep, has a legal, uh, legal status of a Vlad, Vlad, will she actually confine? What about Amapelas Mus Nachash? This charge is something which has a snake like appearance. Hoira Chanina. Here comes the whole story. So, who ruled on it? The Chacham's name was Chanina, who was the nephew, Ben Achib, the uh, brother's son, Shell of Rabbi Shua. He says it qualifies. Ima, the mother's male lady. Halach Rabbi Yasef. So, Rabbi Yasef went ahead and had a discussion with Sipa Dvar and presented the story of the Fnei Rabbi Gamliel for the Nasi, the leader, that uh, there was a Rod, there was a person, or Hanina ben Achash who uh, considered it a Vlad. Pretty, you know, surprising ruling. Shalach Lai, Rabbi Gamliel sent a message to uh, Rabbi Yeshua, come along with your nephew for a discussion. Let's, uh, let's see where he's coming from. We have to... Uh, Investigate, you know, the source of this surprising ruling. Haneg, bring along with you, Ben Achicha, your nephew, boy, and come with me to justify this ruling. Okay, so Rishu and his nephew got on the road, on the way to Rish to Rishon about the Chasn on their uh, journey. Yatsa Kalas Chanin lacrosse. So what happens that Chanina, the, the nephew's daughter-in-law, came out towards uh, towards Rishu with a Shiloh. Lo and behold, this exact story. Amalek, she tells him, Rebbe, HaPelas, what would you say if she discharges a Nachash? Amalek, he says, no validity, Ima Tahira. Amalek, says she responded, but I heard in your name, Amalek, my mother-in-law, her mother-in-law is now the wife of Hanina. Hanina being a Rishor's nephew. So my mother-in-law told me that Ima Tmeya, it does generate uh, two months later. But Amala, and Rabbi Shur, you know, was caught off by his surprise. Is really? I'm being quoted? 
as having ruled that it's considered a valid vlad. Mezatam, do you call why? Did she tell you the reasoning, the rationale behind my ruling? And she says, yeah, I'll tell you. That what you said was, because the, you know, the configuration of the eye, it's, it's a round eye, like a human eye, so it has similar features and similar status. Ooh, when he heard that, it jogged his memory. Because it was more than just the halacha, it was the background, it was the rationale. Based on her words, Niska Bishua, so her words triggered Bishua's memory, and he recalled that in fact, he's the source of this ruling. It wasn't his nephew's uh, own, you know, uh, invention. It came from him. Me, Rabbi Shua. I ruled and I gave the reason. So he sent a message from Gulil. Blame it on me. It was coming from me. And this is, you know, this is the uh, halacha based on the Amr um, Abayis. Abayis says, we have an interesting lesson from this story. Whenever a Rav is asked, uh, you know, Shaila, ideally, it shouldn't just be a one-word answer. You know, Rebelski was always there. Rebelski Atzal always, no matter what time, day and night, it wasn't just mutter asr. He'd sit on the phone, he would explain, he'd, you know, this is the rush, this is the, the, the Ramah, and he would like, go into the background, you would walk away with an understanding, a background. Almost like, it was like a teaching moment for him. Let me teach you how to analyze the Shailah, how to come to proper conclusions. Am Rabbi Yishmah, we learn from this, Tzum Rabbonon, Atamut Chacham, the Amar Mosa, who presents, you know, halacha, lame about time, he should add a reason to it. The chimat karloi mitka. Because this way, in the future, if he's reminded of it, it will be easier. So if he, uh, if he forgets, it will be easier to remind him based on the background and the understanding. Continues the mission. So back to the Isha, who discharges some fetus like, uh, you know, entity. The question is whether it has validity to trigger two months later. Apelos Shafir. Shafir is the external. Um, like the shell of the fetus, like the, the skin, the membrane, which uh, doesn't really look very much like a, a fetus. In fact, it's filled with liquid, shafir mali mai, mali dam full of blood, mali gnunim, various colored uh, you know, liquids in there. Any chashesh love the land. She, she need not be concerned that there was a blood there, because uh, these are clearly very undeveloped uh, you know, entities, not indicative of uh, much going. But Mayam Rukam, if this sphere was formed, so the limbs are sort of discernible somewhat. So now you see it was on its way to being a child and uh, has validity. Teshel is in the cave, so now she has to be Machmer. She doesn't know the, uh, you know, the gender is undefined, so she has to treat herself as though she gave birth to a Zachar, which has a shorter. Uh, span of Yimei Tahara, only 33 days. And regarding Yimei Tuma, Tuma, she has to observe the uh, two weeks of the, of, of the Tuma Slade of Nekeva, just in case. Hapela's sandal, let's say she discharges something which looks like a sandal. Sandal means it's a fetus whose face was sort of bashed in, it was uh, crushed by uh, by his companion, but you know, by uh, a, a, twin, a twin fetus alongside him. Or she notices this uh, placenta, the embryonic sac. That's all she has to show. So in this case as well, she has to observe both tracks just in case because the sandal is considered a vlad and the shilya, well, it's not actually a vlad, but where there's smoke, there's fire, there's a shilya, there's a sack, there must have been a vlad there that, uh, you know, apparently disintegrated, but there was a vlad. Teisho, Zachar, and Nekev, she observed both tracks, Zachar, and Nekev. Ask the Gemara, Bishloimah, I understand, you know, the first two examples. A sphere filled with water, filled with blood. Like Lumi, it has no uh, status. But the colored material. That seems to indicate that there was something there of Vlad that disintegrated. It wouldn't have disintegrated to this extent. If it would have been developed to the point of validity, it would not have just turned into this, you know, mush. Look, uh, you need to drink an excessive amount of uh, alcohol, of wine, to dissolve, uh, you know, this developed fetus. Kama yain chai. How much wine, undiluted wine, strong wine, do you think she drank? Shasas ime shalzed, the mother of this drink, which would have dissolved the uber. Meaning, it certainly never happened. That it was really something going, so we don't give it status. Rabba Amar molitnan. Rabbi gives a different reason why there's no concern about blood, because we're talking that it's 
filter capacity, this, this uh, pouch. Vimisa this mucha mitmach, and in fact, it was really already a partially developed fetus that just dissolved. Mixer chosa would be missing, there would be some space in that sack. Because when something, you know, dissolves, it sort of, it, it, it sort of shrinks and there would be some, you know, empty space. Ravada baraba omar gvanam tana. Look, the mission says colors. Misa tzmuchim itmach. In fact, it was a fetus that dissolved. Kulu b'chad gavna avad kayu would be one consistent color. You wouldn't have, you know, various colors. Tanya b'shol aimer. Okay, speaking of which, we spoke about the alcohol causing all kinds of, you know, ramifications. So b'shol says, I'll tell you some interesting stories. B'shol aimer. I was involved in the Yechever Kadisha, burying people. Their tradition was that after they buried and the, uh, all that was left was with bones, they would go relocate the bones into some uh, like these burial caves. So he was involved in transferring the bones and he would observe the differences between different... I would observe the bones of the Mason. Now it's an interesting phenomenon. If a fellow was uh, accustomed to drinking, you know, raw wine, strong wine, as much as and you would have these burnt, you know, like dried out bones, uh, as, uh, which were affected by this uh, strong alcohol effect. Mazuk, a fellow who drink uh, overly diluted wine, which didn't have much body left, as much as his bones would be blackish, it would be lacking in, in nutrients. But Karoi, a fellow who drank well balanced, you know, wine, properly diluted, not too much, not too little, his bones looked healthy. And lush, at smoice of Meshucha, they were nice and smooth and healthy. And likewise, Vahom Mishish Siyas and Murmachilasai, if a fellow would, you know, regularly drink more than, uh, than his food, at smoice of Srufen, his bones would be dried out. Chilas Murmachilasai, the opposite, too much food, more than drink. So I said, Schuin would black, Karoi, had a well balanced diet, at smoice of, looked, uh, you know, healthy and lush, Meshucha. Tanya, furthermore, Says a bashol, Aimer, he be tame as some say Rech and Kabir Misimi, he was involved in burying me. Some Pamachas, one time, Ratz the Achar Tzvi, I was chasing after a Tzvi. And our show points out that the, this and the next story are not to be taken literally, it's a symbolic of engagement with, you know, spiritual forces, spiritual phenomena, and all kinds of um, lessons to be learned from these stories. In any case, just in the literal sense, he's saying that he was chasing that tzviv and achnasti b'tzich b'kulis shal meis. And on my chase, I entered the uh, kulis, which is a thigh bone of a mace. And it was so giant and huge, I kept on running inside that limb. Rasti achrav shalosh parasoi for three parasol. And I still couldn't reach the, uh, I didn't catch up with the, with the animal, but tzvilo yigati, the kulis lay kolsan. I wasn't at the end of the kulis. Okay, so it's time to give up and go back home. I went back home, I, you know, turned back, reverse. Amrly, they told me. Oh, not to wonder. You know, it was so big. I said, this was the uh, limb of the giant. Tanya, Abishol, Aymer. Another story. So I'm reburying over there, and suddenly the floor opened, and I'm in this uh, burial cave. And I find myself standing, astonishingly, standing inside the Vamati Gagal Enishal Mes Adchaitmi. I'm up to my, my nose in this deep eye socket of a mace. Shazat Lachoy, when I went back to the, uh, I left the area, I believe my friend told me, I shall have Shalom. This is the eye of Av Shalom. Son of Dabra Malach, who uh, unfortunately was drawn after his desires and led astray by his eyes. Hence, this huge eye representing the. Uh, power of, of desire and the Kayachatuma. And the Masha explains that uh, the point is he was standing in there, he felt totally enveloped by this tremendous power, this force of Tuma. And it reached all the way to the uh, the Chaitim, to the nostrils, which is where the Neshama is, is, is related to and I uh, you know quickly turned around and detached myself from this Tuma disengage from its effect. So you'll think, okay, it's not so impressive. How big could the socket have been? Abishol was a, was a midget, very short. So up to his nostrils, not so uh, grand. It's not true, he's very tall, actually. Abishol, he was the uh, tallest of his generation, Rabbi Tarfin. And how tall was that? Rabbi Tarfin, a Gaelic safe, Rabbi Tarfin, from a um, later generation. 
would um, would only reach uh, Magilak safe only reach up to uh, Rabbi Abba's uh, shoulders. And you think Rabbi Tarfun was short. He himself was tall. Rabbi Tarfun, Aruch B'dar Rabbi, the tall, of his, the tall one of his generation, Rabbi Meir. Who's after him? Magiel Aksef, he would only reach uh, up to the shoulders of Rabbi Tarfun. Rabbi Meir, Aruch B'dar Chavan, he was the tallest of generation. The Rabbi and Rabbi, Magiel Aksef, he would only reach his shoulders. The Rabbi himself was Aruch B'dar Chavan. Rabbi Chia would only reach his shoulders. Magiel Aksef, Rabbi Chia himself was Aruch B'dar Chavan. Rabbi Rav, who was a later generation, Magiel Aksef, only reached his Shoulders. And Rav himself was tall. Rabbi Yehuda, who came after Magil Aksef, only reached his shoulders. Rabbi Yehuda, he was the tallest. The Ada Dailo was his servant. His name was Ada Dailo, the Shamas, the waiter of the Chacham. Magil Aksef only reached his shoulders. Turn to the next time. And to get an idea how tall Ada Dailo was, so we have this fellow, Prash Divina, who came from Pomodisa. Prash Divina, the Pomodisa, Koyle, Ada Dailo, Paul Gay. He would only reach up to half the height of uh, Adadayla. And how tall was this fellow? The Kuliyama, everybody else, Koi, they would only reach the Parsha Divina. The Prash Divina, the Pumbadis, Adharte, only reach his, uh, up to his uh, waist. So you can figure out a who was the uh, top of the uh, line here, was super tall, and still when he uh, ended up in the, the eye of Avshalim, he was overtaken up to his nostrils. You can imagine how huge, how large size it was. And the, um, the Farshan point out that uh, the Chlam Sefer adds that quite a show that it's just a metaphor, just a, presenting the concept of Koyach of Tumma and how to detach from Koyach of Tumma. He says that uh, don't think of a shawl was just a you know, person of, uh, you know, spiritual low stature and that uh, he was you know overtaken by the Kayachatuma infected by it no Abishol was the tallest of the tallest of the tall meaning the greatest of the great in, in Ruchnius and righteousness and Sitkas and nevertheless he was uh, he felt affected by the Kayachatuma until he you know forced himself he de- detached and disengaged the um, Masha points out that uh, Regarding this story and the previous story of the uh, thigh, you know, that he's stuck in the thigh, that the point is, you can't uh, expect to be immune from Koyach Atum. Everybody is susceptible. Everybody uh, has to protect himself from Koyach Atum, which uh, seek to attack us on all sides. The only way is to totally turn around. Chazat Lachera turned around. I made a reverse. And then, once I disengaged, meaning you can't engage in Tahar and Tum at the same time. A person feels overwhelmed and affected by negative impulse, negative uh, spirits, the only solution is turn around and immerse in good things in Torah, but first you have to disengage. You can't be, you know, straddling both at the same time. You're not going to really refer to yourself to really experience the beauty of Torah, beauty of Tefillah. You have to totally detach, disengage, identify with the Tahara, try to experience it, and slow going, eventually pick up and develop an appetite, and really enjoy the bliss of Torah. Ashrecha by the and certainly by the Havon. Okay, let's recap today's stuff. We spoke about the all kinds of uh, defective uh, fetuses, loyal leinu, most of which uh, don't qualify for Tumas Leda, they don't have validity. We have the Atum, we have the Pan of Musmas, and we have the double-backed one, we have all kinds of unfortunate situations. We spoke about an interesting uh, question of the month, you know, the count of the months regarding the uh, birth of a Vahima, vis-a-vis the birth of an Adam. We spoke about the story of Rabbi Yeshua, who recalled his own ruling after he was presented with the, uh, the reasoning behind it. We have the next Mishnah, with examples of things that uh, do have, uh, you know, uh, status, things which don't. We concluded with the interesting stories of Abba Shol. Okay, all the best to you and that's Lachar.